Father, we, we thank you, Lord, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth, that we can worship you in freedom, at least right now, and we thank you for, God, everything you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Well, a lot been going on. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want everybody to turn, take their Bibles out this morning and turn to um, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. This is one of those mornings that I absolutely had no idea what we were going to turn to until we had a few minutes in praise and worship. Yeah. But I think it's important this morning, considering the the type of ministry that we are, considering the type of church we are, I guess the type of pastor that I am, you know, we we believe the Bible and we believe that, you know, that sin is the problem and that God has called people to repentance, both the unsaved and and the Christians, if we're living in sin or we're, you know, have a, uh, things in our lives that are habits, that are lifestyles that God says is sin and, and He wants us to quit. So, you know, I do preach about that a lot and I know that you hear me say it quite a bit because so many churches don't say it anymore. I mean, it's just that, that's the reality that we live in, right? Second Peter, Paul warned Timothy that in the last days, he said, the time would come when they would not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust would they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they would turn away from the truth and be turned into fables. And boy, that's the time we're living in. So that's why I dedicate a lot of time and preaching and energy on focusing on that aspect of the Word of God and that aspect of the Gospel, because so many people are missing that, and because... It's put many people in jeopardy of, of spending an eternity separated from God in hell. I mean, it's a serious matter um, to, to look at sin the way God looks at it and to turn away from it and to run away from it. But I want to say this, and I want to make this very clear because, you know, we've, we've been out on the campus this week. We go out on the campus and share the gospel with people. Um, right now I'm in a debate on Facebook with a, a woman whose family's full of Muslims. And, you know, again, just like with the homosexual discussion or the Muslim Islamic discussion or whatever, um, you know, the moment you say something about a group, even if it's true, <laughs> even if it's factual, um, there's this emotional knee jerk response out there to label you as being full of hate if you don't agree with somebody. Or you're not tolerant of uh, a certain, you know, religion or a certain belief or a certain uh, practice like homosexuality. You get labeled as being full of hate. I mean, it's amazing this morning in the discussion and over this last night discussion about Islam. Of course, America, we've just suffered a terrible terrorist attack. You know, the Boston bombing. Um, and of course, I don't think anybody is surprised to find out that they're Muslims. I mean, there's no one's surprised about that. Um, you know, for some reason, you're called a racist or a hater if you, you know, suspect that a Muslim might have been behind it. But, you know, there's reasons why. And what's interesting is I, I spoke out about this thing a little bit, about the Islamic problem and the terrorist problem and the, the, and the teaching, the advocation of killing uh, others that don't believe like you, that is taught within Islam. It's taught in the Quran, it's taught in the Hadith, it's taught in the Sunnis. This is something that not only did Muhammad himself do, he slaughtered uh, millions of people, I mean thousands of people, I should say, his, his religion, probably millions now, but he slaughtered people, cut off people's heads, Jews and Christians, um, and he told his followers to do what he did and to follow him. I mean, that is... The fact, did Jesus instruct his followers to go kill folks? No. It's simple. 
We don't kill people over differences of religious beliefs. This ought to be a fundamental um, realization to humanity worldwide. That there ought to be within humanity the ability to have freedom of thought and freedom of speech and freedom of religion without worrying about being raped, tortured, shot, killed, or your head chopped off. Okay? But a lot of countries, they don't, they don't have that luxury. Even in, I visited Nigeria uh, a couple of times years ago. And it's in a brutal war with the Muslims trying to take over from the north. And the, the country's almost split right in two. And the horrible, I mean, when I was there, the Muslims invaded uh, churches all over uh, northern, uh, the middle and to northern Nigeria and killed um, thousands. I think it was about 3,000 Christians when I was there and burned churches down to the ground. I have witnessed this. I have sat down. I've been in the airport. I was in the airport in Lagos, Nigeria um, with a man sitting next to me who was from the Sudan, a Muslim from the Sudan. And we were t discussing. And, you know, again, we should be able to discuss things. That you don't know. You know, people have a free will. They don't have to agree that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the Messiah, the way, the truth, and the life. That he died for our sins, that he rose from the dead, that he's the only way to heaven. Hey, I'm all for freedom for you not to believe that if you don't want to believe that. Right? Go ahead. That's your choice. I ought to have the same freedom to believe it. Right? Without worrying about whether you're going to shoot me, kill me, or chop my head off. Right? But that's just not the way it is in the world. Of course, it's not the way Jesus said. But I was talking to this man from the Sudan. And we talked for a few minutes about Christianity and about Islam and his beliefs and my beliefs. And we talked for a few minutes very calmly, very peacefully. He was a very well-dressed uh, businessman from the Sudan. And I said, well, can we agree on one thing after we got through disagreeing about many things? <laughs> I said, can we agree on one thing that it is morally wrong to kill someone who does not agree with your religious beliefs? He would not agree to that. So again, this is not something that I'm just making up. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've heard it with my own ears. And I've researched it. And you know, it's, I'm sorry, but you know, she, she tried, she called me a racist for saying that most of the terrorism in the world and most of the killing for religious reasons, not all, but most, is Muslims. Now, I didn't say, she goes, you're saying all. You're a racist. And I thought, well, Muslims, people can of every race are Muslims. This doesn't have to do with race. Now, I know that most of them happen to be Arab, but it's not even the same uh, Arabs. There's different ethnic groups of Arabs. So uh, Muslims are not a race. They're a religion. Okay? And so I got called a racist. I said, this, that doesn't even apply. And then I got called, you know, you're putting out hate. Why? For putting out facts? I can't, I can't change it that 90% of the terrorist attacks are done by Muslims. I can't change the fact that 700 million Muslims believe in the coming of the Imam Mahdi, who they say is their Messiah, who's going to rule the world from Jerusalem and bring everyone under submission to Islam by force. 700 million of them believe this. Okay? These, these are facts. I've listened to Muslim clerics preach this. Muslim clerics out of Iran, out of Syria, out of Lebanon, in Israel, in Iraq. Even Muslim clerics here in America calling for terrorist attacks on America. But you know what? It's amazing. This is the brainwashing, you guys, going on in the world. Listen, Isaiah talked about it in Isaiah 5. He said, woe to them that call good evil and evil good. How do you call Islam a religion of peace? Boy, if that's not calling evil good, I don't know what is, right? But I'm sorry, that's just the, the way it goes. But in, in, in all that, what I'm getting at is even with the homosexual debate, the Muslim debate, Everybody gets called haters. Christians in particular, we get called haters if we say, no, that's wrong. That's sin. It's morally wrong. It's ethically wrong. It's the, the God of creation is not like that. 
But I want to say this about us and about our church. Just because we preach those things, just because we preach homosexuality is wrong, that it is a sin, that God doesn't approve of it. Just because we say that, that Islam is a false religion, it's antichrist, it's, it's, it's obsessed with death, it, it, you know, and it is. Just because we say the truth doesn't mean we hate anybody. I don't hate Muslims. I don't hate uh, homosexuals. I don't hate um, communists. I don't hate socialists. I don't hate even my enemies. I don't hate them. They, they will say that because they're doing that. They, they do that. It's an emotional response to get you away from talking about the problems either in their ideology or their religion or their behavior. But here's the fact. I want to say this. I don't think for one second that our church is perfect. I don't think we're perfect. I don't think we have it all together. I don't think we've arrived. I don't think we're sinless or better than anybody else. Listen, here is the truth. And I'm, I'm going to share this this morning. For this pastor, for me, Pastor Dean, for Fire and Grace Church, I can speak. Listen, we are not thinking that we have it all together, that we are perfect, that we are sinless, that we are more holy than anybody else. We all in here struggle with the flesh and with sin and with issues. We are not a perfect people, but I can assure you this, and we're going to read this here. You're either a Christian in a church that's, that's striving to press in to the Lord Jesus Christ and to His high calling for your life and to grow and to mature and to change and to get better and better as you go, or you're not. So one thing I can say about a church, we are far from perfect. We don't think we're better than anybody. We know that, that, that just like, you know, we preach to the homosexual or to the Muslim or to, you know, the, the unsaved person or even the backslidden Christian that you've got to turn from sin. You've got to give Jesus your whole life. You've got to give him everything. And that, that only the blood of Jesus can cleanse your sins. Look, we believe that. There's nothing but the blood of Jesus that can wash away sin, that can clean your heart. There's only one Savior, only one Messiah, only one who was promised by all those prophecies thousands of years and hundreds of years before they came to pass. There's only one who came and lived a sinless life and gave His life on the cross and paid the full price for the sins of every man, woman, boy, and girl. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord God Almighty in the flesh, died on that cross so that we could all, all of us sinners, all of us deceived people, all of us messed up, screwed up folks, could have a chance to be forgiven, washed clean, not by works of righteousness which we have done, not because we earned it, but because we came to Him and fell on our face and humbly admitted, I am a sinner, I am evil, I am wicked, I am unclean in my heart, in my mind. I am not worthy even for you to look at me, God, but because of Jesus because what Jesus did for me, Lord, I ask you to forgive me, to cleanse me, and to help me not do that stuff anymore. Well, that's simple. And we don't believe that we're better than somebody else just because we've done that and somebody else hasn't yet. We just know people need that. Everybody needs to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. The Lord Jesus. Everybody needs to be saved. Matter of fact, the, the love of God is that it says God desires all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen? And, and don't think for a second, because I do preach on one day God's judgment and wrath is going to come on the wicked. But that doesn't mean I don't believe that God loves us. God loves every single person that's ever come into existence. He has good desires and good plans. We're the ones who screw that up. We're the ones who rebel. We're the ones who run away from Him and His plan. We're the ones... I mean, can you fathom running away from love, mercy, and forgiveness? 
Can you fathom running away from knowing the Creator who made you? But people run all the time. They run away from Him because they want some temporal pleasure in this world. And they run, and they run, and they run. And, and even with the running, even with the rebelling, even with the sin, He still offers, come to Me. Come to Me and I'll wash you. Come to Me and I'll forgive you. Come to Me and I'll set you free from the devil and the demons that torment you. Come to Me and I'll heal your mind and your emotions. Come to Me and I'll heal your spirit. Even when we know the truth sometimes and have been born again and been saved and we run away back into the world and, and become that prodigal son or daughter that's, that's living in the pig pen and eating the filth of the world and feeding on it and wallowing in it. He's still standing there as the Father longing for us to come home to Him. And I just want to say that this morning. This church believes in redemption, in forgiveness, in the mercy of God, in the grace of God, in His desire to forgive and save anyone who will come to Him. Amen? And don't think for one minute that this church believes that Christians don't screw up and sin and fall. I've never met a Christian who lives it perfect, sinless, spotless. And guess what? Even if they do, they're going to do it for a season. And then they're going to fall on their face. And I'm talking about the ones that are trying. I'm not talking about the ones who aren't trying. Okay? And listen, I don't want any of you who hear the kind of preaching that I do a lot of, I don't want any of you to be condemned if you fall, if, you, if you're getting back up, asking God to forgive you, and, and trying to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. To know Him. To be with Him. Listen, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Meaning, those who really want the things of the Spirit and they're going after the things of the Spirit and maybe they fall, maybe they screw up, maybe they sin, but they get back up and say, God, forgive me, I'm pressing on. I'm pressing in to Jesus. I'm going after Jesus. I don't want this mess in my life. I'm going after Jesus. There is no condemnation to that person. But to the person who makes excuses and says, you know what, I'm once saved, always saved, no matter how I live, so I can do whatever I want and God's okay with it. No, there is condemnation to you and judgment coming to you. And eternal damnation if you continue in it. But man, I know a lot of Christians, and listen, yes, God looks on the heart. I know some Christians who screw up royally. And frequently. They love God. Messed up. Listen. Let's read this before we go any further. I'm sorry. That was just the introduction. I'm just sharing what's on my heart this morning. Look at, let's start reading from verse 1. Philippians chapter 3 verse 1. He says this, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I the more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Basically, Paul had, some say, several doctrines. So he was a lawyer, a doctor of theology, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Now, now let's just pause for a second there. He's saying, listen to what this Christian says, who's been born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit, 
filled with the Holy Spirit, operating in the gifts. He says, I count all things dung. And he says, I, I, I count all this dung that I might win Christ. But wait a minute. He's saved. He's already saved. What is he talking about that I may win Christ? He's talking about there's more. Amen? I can get closer to him. I can know him. I can learn to hear his voice. I can feel his presence. I can learn to walk with him and talk with him and hear him and, and have an intimate, personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I can have more. I got it now. Listen, he said, I have it now, but I want to win more of it. I want to go after him. It's kind of like a, a marriage. I mean, it never, it never ends loving your spouse and, and, and trying to win their heart and trying to guard their heart and trying to, to know them and, and be closer to them. Listen, in a marriage, you either get closer or you drift apart. It's the same with Jesus. You either are pressing in closer to him or you're drifting away from him. And it doesn't mean if you fall one time, you're drifting away from Him. As long as you get back up, look at what He goes on to say. Here's a Christian now saying that I may win Christ. Some people don't even, don't even comprehend that. He said that I may win Christ and be found in Him. Look, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Look at what He says. That I may know Him. And the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, that I may know Him. Now here's a Christian speaking, Paul the Apostle, who already knows Jesus. Who already who met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Who heard the words of Jesus, I am Jesus whom you persecute. I'm going, to, I'm going to make you an apostle. I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. I'm going to use you to turn people from the power of Satan and from idols to the power of God. I'm going to use you in great ways. This is Paul who had visions. This is Paul who was taken to the third heaven and saw and heard unspeakable things that he was not allowed to say. And he says right here, that I may know him. See, the true Christian stays hungry. The true Christian is constantly saying that I may know Him. That I may know Him and win Him. That I may draw near to Him. He says that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead and I love this verse. Listen to this verse. This is what I'm saying this morning. What I'm saying about me and as a pastor, this church, Fire and Grace Church, and the ministry here, what I'm saying is this verse right here. No matter what we say or speak about the homosexual community or the lukewarm Christian community or the Islamic issues or whatever we say, listen, we don't think that we've arrived. He says, not as though I have already attained, either we're already perfect. But I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ, Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark. All you have to ask yourself this morning, am I pressing toward the mark of the high calling? Am I pressing toward the mark to know Jesus more intimately, more powerfully? Am I seeking to know the power of His resurrection? And you know what that means? The power of His resurrection to live that holy life, to live that obedient life, to live that life that flows in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the power of God, that shares that healing and that deliverance and that power with other people. That I may know Him. I don't count myself, he said. This is the Apostle Paul now. I don't count myself to have apprehended anything. So you know what that shows? It shows him, I'm, 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 on, I'm on, on a chase. I'm chasing after God. I'm chasing to know Jesus. 
I'm chasing to be more and more like Him. To be more and more close to Him. To be more and more obedient to Him. To know His power and His presence. And then He talks about the righteousness. Not the righteousness, His own righteousness. Listen. No matter how hard you try. And don't get me wrong. We're supposed to. We're supposed to try. And use our will and use our strength and use. We're supposed to love God, which means to obey God, right? Jesus said, if you love me, you obey me, right? But we're supposed to love God and obey God, he said, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? That's spirit, soul, and body right there. Everything is supposed to love God. Everything is supposed to, to try to love God and obey God. But don't think for one minute that you're going to do it perfectly. Supposed to try. Supposed to shoot for it. Right? Do you know the definition of sin? Let me give it to you. The Greek definition of sin is a simple word. It means or a simple phrase to miss the mark. You missed the target. I shot my rifle the other day. I guess about 75 yards, 100 yards. First, first time, only shot it twice that day. But from my first time, from about 7,500 yards, it was one inch off the center. I missed the mark. I said, well, that's a pretty good shot. That's right, I was aiming in the right direction. Amen. See, the problem is not Christians who are aiming in the right direction and missing it a little bit. The problem is Christians who are facing the other direction and headed the other direction and shooting at the wrong target and going the wrong way. <laughs> right? And you know what? With practice, mm -hmm, practice, I can probably come in and close that inch down a little bit. Let's stay. And that's right. It's the Alabama boy talking. We shoot guns around here. But you hear what I'm saying? I hope you do. Because you know what? There's a lot of us in here, I think, wrestle with feelings of being unworthy at times. Let me clue you in on something. You are. I am. I promise you, y'all, I feel unworthy so many times. Sometimes I just say, Lord, I shouldn't be preaching. I shouldn't be praying for people. But you know what the Lord says? You're not unworthy, son. I make you worthy. Right? You stay after me, that makes you worthy. Not perfect by any means. You know, I'll be honest. Just to share one thing, you know. Here I am taking a week off so we can spend time going to the campus and preaching and praying and talking to people and everything. And, you know, do a deliverance, had a deliverance session this week, casting demons out, preaching on the street, and my wife and I have one of a knockdown, drag out fight. We hadn't had a fight like that, and I don't know when. And we both were in sin in that fight. <laughs> okay? I just, and, and after it, we both just sit down and go, what are we doing? You know, there is truth to Romans 7. Some people take it and, again, use it as an excuse to live a lifestyle of sin. But there is truth in Romans 7 when Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do, and things I don't want to do, I do. And Christians mess up. <coughs> Even the best. You know? You know, there's, and, and I'll, you know, I'll bring this in, you know, back in the late 80s and even in the 90s and even some here recently. I mean, we've seen well-known ministers of the gospel 
And I'm not talking about the false prophets and teachers out there, but I'm talking about well-known ministers of the, of the gospel have, have gotten into sin, have fallen. And everybody thinks that because they're, they're well-known or they have big ministries with big incomes and they have big influences and big book deals, that they're not somehow not human. It's just when they, when they screw up, it's just, you know, on the news, right? I remember when Jimmy Swaggart fell. You know, a lot of people hated him. You know why they hated him so much? And why they rejoiced so much when he fell, because Jimmy used to preach against sin. Jimmy used to expose the way God felt about sin. He used to call people to repentance. He stood up against the false Roman Catholic Church. He preached the gospel to, to the world in crusades and through television. And even the, the late Leonard Ravenhill, one of the greatest prophets that Britain and America has ever known, said that Jimmy, at the time, was probably one of the best ministers that was alive then. But you know what? I remember the day, everybody knew back in 1987 and 1988, everybody knew that I loved Jimmy Swaggart. I loved watching his programs. I loved his preaching. I loved that man. And I knew the anointing of God was really on him. But you know what? He messed up. Jimmy fell into sexual sin. But you know one thing I know about Jimmy? That was not his heart. That was not his intention. That was not his desires to have that in his life. That man loved God. Prayed two and a half hours every day. Read the Bible through every six months. Was preaching nearly every day of his life. But he was human. And I remember how these new believers, I'd led a bunch of people to the Lord, you know, here in the Opelika, Auburn area, family members, friends. And I remember when it came in the news, you know, and it came out on the news that Jimmy Swaggart had been caught with that prostitute. That's horrible. Shouldn't happen, you know. But guess what? It does. And you know, they were all looking at me like I was going to fall apart or something. They, I'm literally, they were standing in a semicircle around me going, what do you think? What about this? What about Jimmy? And I said, he's a man. Just like I am. And this is exactly what I said. I said, he's a man just like I am. He puts his pants on one leg at a time. Any man can fall. Any woman can fall. Does that mean... His life is over and his call from God is over and his ministry is over and God's through with him and won't forgive him. I mean, that's the way even a lot of Christians treated him back then, like he had the plague, like he had leprosy or something. No, he fell into sin. He messed up. But God wants to forgive him. God wants to restore him. God wants to use him again. You get my point. I know there's fallen ministers, you know, there's some that's fallen and I would say not fallen, but rather dove in the pool. <laughs> they didn't fall in, they dove in, but they won't get out of it. They won't quit swimming in it. They don't have true godly sorrow over it. They don't have true, a true brokenness over it. We know we've seen that here in Auburn, right? There's a difference. I'm not, I hope that you, you guys understand, I'm not condoning Habitual sin. I'm not condoning falling from God. I'm not condoning rebellion and disobedience or anything like that. But I'm just saying there's a difference between the Christian who's pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling, who may stumble, who may sin, who may miss the mark, versus one who's decided I'm going to make theological excuses why I can do it again and again and again and again. Right? Of course, that was a point of discussion this weekend as well. But anyway, it's not a sermon on grace versus law. We need to do that one here pretty soon. I will say it, though, this much, though. They keep screaming, these people out here, these false teachers keep screaming, we're not under the law. And truly, we're not under the law to... Keep feast days and animal sacrifices and new moons and Sabbaths and all those things that they had to keep and circumcision and all that under the old covenant. We don't have to do all those things. But you know what? The moral law of God about sin carried on into the New Testament. Newsflash. Hyper grace preachers. Joseph Prince and the rest of you. 
It carried on. The requirements of the moral law continue to this day. God doesn't say you can be immoral and just wallow in it and practice it and and enjoy a lifestyle of of drunkenness or sexual immorality or drugs or you know what I'm saying or just witchcraft. What you can't do anything you want. I mean, it's amazing that preachers that we even we even have to explain this. This ought to be. Christianity 101. Right? I want you to go. Well, let's just keep reading. When he says, verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. And that word there just means mature. Or complete in Him. Let us be perfect or mature. Be thus minded... And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same things. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ." whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So he's telling us there just what I said this morning. What? I haven't apprehended. We haven't apprehended. But we're pressing toward the bar. But he said, yes, there are some. I'm warning you, there are some that used to be. But now they're enemies of the cross. Well, there's some out there now that's enemies. Right? False teachers. Maybe they started out right. But now they're enemies. They're enemies of the cross. And Paul says though here, mark those, or mark them that walk so as you have us an example. And so what was Paul saying? If Paul was the example, and Paul was saying this very clearly. Look at me. He's saying, look at how I, I'm, I'm still running after Jesus after all these years. Amen. So my question for you this morning. What are you pursuing? What are you chasing? Uh, Years ago during the Brownsville revival, there was a minister named Tommy Tenney. And he preached at the revival some, but he got well known during that time period for a book called The God Chasers. I met Tommy Tenney at the Christian Booksellers thing in Nashville one year. He loved God. He was after God. God used him in some revivals. I mean, he's like a fourth or fifth generation Pentecostal preacher. Uh, But I'll never forget the title of that book. The God Chasers. Where are you? God Chaser, World Chaser. Man, Jesus chaser or woman and sex chaser? Or for women, man and sex chaser? We're chasing after something. Right? You know, the the suicide bombers of Islam, they're chasing after their 72 virgins that promised in heaven. They're chasing after something. While they're blowing up children and mothers in restaurants and on streets. See how messed up that is? I mean, that's messed up. I mean, you know, we have someone here today from China. They know the history there. When communism took over China, Mao took over China, and all the people he killed, and not just Christians, but many, many Christians, but just, just killed millions of people. The Soviet Union did the same thing. Nazi Germany did the same thing. Unfortunately, I believe the American government now is doing the same thing. I mean, I'm not too ashamed to say or afraid to say that we're involved in wars we shouldn't be involved in. It's sad. As you think about it, killing people, killing people because they don't think like you think. God, how 
messed up is that? And I'm the one that hates people for bringing that up. I don't hate people. I don't hate any Chinese people. I don't hate Russians. I don't like communism. And I don't like Islam. And I don't like the demons of homosexuality and lust and perversion and all these forces of darkness and ideologies that are demonic doctrines of men that control people and lead people into these things. Now people are still responsible. I mean, they either yield to these demon spirits or they yield to God. But again, we have to, we just ask the question, am I a God chaser or a Lenin chaser? You see what I'm saying? Do I follow Jesus or Stalin? Do I follow Jesus or Karl Marx? Do I follow Jesus or Muhammad? Do I follow Jesus or Buddha? And the, and the question is going to be coming soon. Do I follow Jesus or the new world government and the, the leader of that world government, the Antichrist that's coming? Do I follow? Who am I going to follow? The devil's going to make sure we choose. That's why God says, go ahead and choose. Deny yourself. Take up your cross, Jesus said, and follow me. Forsake everything to be my disciple. If your hand offends you, cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. What is He saying? Don't let anything, any sin, any lust, anything idol or religion or belief or ideology or government, even, even our national patriotism has to be Below loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? God chaser, government chaser. God chaser, Muhammad chaser. You hear what I'm saying? Here's what's interesting. The verse in 2 Corinthians 3, it says this. It talks about beholding as we behold the Lord. We are changed into His image. Whatever you keep your eyes on, whatever you're chasing, whatever you're focused on, whatever is first in your life, whatever is your passion and your zeal, that is what you become. You know what I'm saying? If it's Jesus and the Word of God, you will become more and more like Him and you will become, you, you will just be enamored and in love with Him. Amen. I, you know, I think about Muslims again. I, I think about Muslims wanting to take over the world. Why? When you get it, what do you have? What, are you going to kill everybody that believe like you? And here's the thing funny about Muslims. They'll kill, let's say they got, the, they got control of the world, they kill everybody that believe like them. Then they're going to start killing each other. What do you think they're doing in Syria? Well, the Sunnis and the Shias, they got to be killing somebody. So if they run out of us unbelieving, non-Muslim infidels, then they start killing each other. I mean, I could tell you some stories. But anyway, I hope y'all are grasp what I'm saying today. All right. The mercy of God. One more scripture, and we're going we're going to end for the day here. The Gospel of John, chapter three. This church believes this. Familiar verse. Verse 16. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son 
Now whosoever believeth in Him, trusts in, relies in, clings to Him, professes Him, and I'm going to put, chases Him, presses into Him. Because the word there is a present tense Greek verb. It means ongoing, continuous action taking place in the present. So he says, For, for God so loved the world that, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves the world. Jesus dying on the cross was proof of that. God desires people to have eternal life in heaven with Him one day. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our hope. He is our salvation. He is the apostle and high priest of our confession. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is God Almighty in the flesh, the the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And the word Lord before His name means supreme being. Amen. That's Jesus. Anything else is a counterfeit. But God loves us so much that He took on human flesh, was beaten, punished, and died on a cross so we could be forgiven when we screw up, when we ask Him to forgive us, and when we press on to know Him. Amen? Christianity is pressing in to Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we we thank you today, God, for your word, for the truth. God, we just say it again that we love homosexuals, we love Muslims, we love communists, we love Buddhists, we love other people in different religions. Lord, it's not about hating them. It's not about wishing harm on them. We don't wish harm on them or evil on them. We just wish them to come to know the truth that Jesus Christ is is the way, the truth, and the life, that His blood washes sin away, that they can be healed of every hurt, wound, and and problem in their lives through Jesus' name, and that He is the only way to heaven. We want people to know that you don't go out killing folks because you don't agree. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus for Your grace, for Your anointing, for the truth to go forth, through each of our lives. Let the, let the grace and the power of, tr- of the love of God and the truth of God go forth through us. And Lord, we pray that many people, that their eyes will be open, their hearts will be open. Whether they be Muslims or communists or Buddhists or whatever that their hearts would be open, their eyes would be open to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, as their true God, the Creator. Lord, we thank You for the truth. We thank You that once we were blind and You you opened our eyes. Well, I pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. And for those of you listening, and anybody here listening, it's simple. If you've never really given your life to Jesus... All you have to do is say, I surrender and mean it. I give up. I give up my own sins, my own habits, my own plans, my own ways. I give up believing lies of the devil. I give it all up, Lord, and I believe that you died on the cross, that you rose from the dead, that you are my sacrifice, my atonement, my payment for my sins. I believe that. Forgive me, Lord, and today be my Lord and Savior. I'm going to follow you. And and you know, it's a simple prayer, but as long as that prayer is truly meant in the heart and then the actions of life walk it out, 
You will be born again. There will be a moment when the Spirit of the living Christ comes in you and re revitalizes your spirit and you will know that you are a child of God. Listen, if you don't know you are a born again child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, then it's time to do it. It doesn't matter. There's a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of people that believe in Jesus. There's a lot of people that go to churches. And then some of them go to churches their whole life, sing in the choir, been baptized, got their baptism certificate on the wall, but they've never truly surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and been born again by the Holy Spirit coming into them. You ask them, do they believe in Jesus? They'd say, yeah. You'd ask them, do they believe they're going to heaven? They'd say, yeah. You ask them, do they believe in the Bible? They'll say, yeah. But when I start getting specific and say, when was the time that you asked Jesus to come into your heart to forgive your sin, to be your Lord, and you felt the Holy Spirit come in with power and give you that peace and that assurance of your salvation? Has that happened? When was your born again experience where your heart was strangely warmed, where the presence of God touched you and you knew that you had encountered God? And you know, there's a lot of people who go, I've never had that happen. Well then my friend... You might believe in Jesus. You might be a, a, a decent person. But you're a Christian only in name. You've never been truly saved. And that's why I can't promise you if you pray the prayer, that's what saves you. Prayer is a good start. We have to confess with our mouths. The Bible says that. Romans 10.9 but you have to believe it in your heart. And then if there's faith, there's actions that show that you mean business with God. And if you mean business with God, He will touch you and fill you with His Holy Spirit and you will know it. I like what an old preacher used to say years ago. If you can be saved and not know it, you could lose it and not miss it. It's like somebody giving me, saying they gave me a hundred dollar bill they never gave me. Right? Listen, when you get saved, you know it. When you meet Jesus, you know it. Right? It's not something you can wonder about. Right? <laughs> All right. Because Jesus is the... He's powerful. Amen? All right. Well, all right. I guess we. I need to quit. Praise God.